Wednesday nights. Good to have you with us tonight as we switch gears. We've been in apologetics for the last five weeks. We were uh, in apologetics as long as Moses was in the wilderness. Uh, we were in there for a long time. And uh, here we are uh, ready to roll with uh, a new Bible study. And what I thought would be kind of fun and appropriate would be this transition into uh, Easter time. To think a little bit about Holy Week coming up in just a few weeks from today. Um, you know, we'll be, we'll be into this in, over the next couple of weeks. And uh, as we head into the last of the, the month of March. So I thought it would be fun to kind of get us in, in, in a mindset as we look toward Holy Week. And to kind of just take a little bit about what we're going to do and, and to kind of walk you through this little path. Here's a little agenda that we have that, that shows you what we're going to be uh, looking at over the next few weeks. To begin with, tonight, we're going to talk about what's known as the triumphant entry into, um, into Jerusalem. So that's going to be something interesting. Um, so that's what we're going to go tonight. This is Jesus' last time coming into uh, Jerusalem. So that's what we're going to be uh, tonight. And then uh, next week, um, we're going to be looking at Judas betraying the Lord, uh, his betrayal, and the Last Supper. So we'll talk about that specifically, what the Passover was as far as the meal, how it would have been held. You know, we like to think about people sitting around a dinner table like we do. They wouldn't have been seated like that. They would have actually been laying down in a reclining position, you know, with their head toward the table and their, their feet away from the table. So we'll talk a little bit about that and show you some images of how that would have worked. Uh, some of the foods. Um, it'd be nice if I bring in some samples with, you know, some foods that they might have had at the, uh, the Last Supper. We'll talk about that. And then the following Wednesday, will be in the middle of Holy Week, and we are going to be showing the Passion of the Christ movie in here. And uh, so we typically, when we have a movie night at church for entertainment, we aren't in the sanctuary for that, we're in the, uh, in the, the fellowship hall. But for Holy Week, we think it's going to fit right in with the whole week of uh, Holy Week. And uh, how many of you all here tonight, have you all seen the Passion of Christ? It's a very, very... Hard movie to watch. Um, I mean, it, it's really emotional. I remember going to see it when it was first released in the theater. There's a lot of subtitles, you know, where you read. Uh, it's in Aramaic, a lot of the, 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 the wording. And, um, and but ultimately, it's about the Lord's crucifixion. So, um, it, it really, I think the timing will be good for Wednesday. Then on Thursday... Well, it's not a Bible study night. It is what we call Monday Thursday. It's a Latin word talking about darkness. And um, it's, it's a service that's held in the shadows. If you just imagine, every light is out in the, in the sanctuary. It's a, you know, we, we really dark it out. And um, candles are lit. It's a candlelight service. And as scripture is read about uh, the Lord Jesus and his betrayal and his death, uh, Candles are extinguished throughout the service. And we also have communion at that time and uh, representing uh, the Last Supper. So all of those things kind of progress Thursday night. And then at the end of the Monday service, if you've never been to a Monday Thursday service, I really, really, really hope that you'll, you'll come. Even if you don't do anything else for Holy Week, try and come to the Monday Thursday service. It really is a powerful service and it ends uh, with what appears to be Jesus under burial cloth. And we, we exit in total silence, and uh, it really is just prepared you spiritually for Good Friday. Uh, and then, of course, for Easter Sunday. So it, it's going to be a very powerful week, and we think this, this teaching, this lesson, is going to go uh, right in there. So that's Lord willing. That's our plan for the next few uh, times we're together. And uh, for those of you that are watching, you know, make sure you hit share, invite somebody to watch. You know, it's amazing how many people don't know the Easter story. You know, they have an idea, but they've never really looked at it. Like, like tonight, when we look at the, uh, the, the Grand Parade, the Rose Parade of all parades, right? Uh, the Palm Parade. When we, when we uh, look at that tonight, there's going to be some things about this that you're, you, you probably didn't know. Uh, so you're going to learn that tonight as well. So usually when we get into those things, in a worship setting, in, in, a, in a preaching message, we go so fast through all the little details. You just presume everybody knows. So be able to take a break, look at it, and digest a little bit, chew on it, 
really just makes the story come alive. And, and tonight, there's a couple of great scriptures we're going to go over that you've heard before, but you're going to find out tonight those are also elsewhere in the Old Testament that you probably do not. So you've heard them your whole life, but you're going to see that Jesus is actually quoting Old Testament scripture. So that's where we're going to go. Um, just a couple of quick updates on the, uh, the church activities that are coming up. Uh, as far as prayer time, remember to keep uh, Carol Mellon during your prayers. I talked with her today a little bit, and uh, she wondered if I was coming to visit her today. And uh, hopefully she's watching, and I told her I couldn't have Bible study tonight, but I'd get up to see her one day this week or on Monday. So I'm uh, looking forward to seeing her. She had a big back surgery, so she's been out of commission for a little bit. So keep her in your, your prayers. Um, and, and, of course, all the folks that we've been praying for. Others that updates are you? I think she's out at, if she's not at Selby, she's going to be either in Selby or Marietta. Oh, yeah. Marietta. But I think they're going to change her around for rehab. You know, she was going to spend a couple days in intensive care after surgery, but she's off the ventilator and all that. So, I mean, they will talk to me today. So, and she was more interested in what I was doing, I think, and tell me what she was going on. So, uh, Bert, yes, that's the other one. Remember Bert, Bert Lyon? Bert's going back in for his uh, heart procedure, as you know. Bert's heart gets out of rhythm all the time. And, they chop them back and they, they do, for lack of a better word, they do some soldering in there. And um, and and the surgery's always go well. The surgeon doesn't do well with it. He's been out for a long time with that. At the last time, he was, uh, you know, on in, in intensive care for about uh, three or four weeks instead of just a day. You know, so that was a, it was a, it was a long road recovery. And there was a touch and go moment for him. So I'm sure he's nervous about that and his family. So let's be in prayer uh, for birth tomorrow. And any others that you all have to want to mention? How's Mariah doing? Is she getting better? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Any, any others? Pray one for each other. Pray for the church. You know, so like I said, one of my favorite times of the year coming up with Easter. I just love it. Um, I like it as much as I do Christmas. I just think they're just wonderful, wonderful times uh, where it's looking on, on God's word together. So, all right. If no other uh, prayer requests, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of life that you give us. And Lord, you're so good to us, even when we're not worthy. Father, we thank you for a church that we can come to and worship and study the Word. Lord, I thank you for those watching at home tonight, those looking in on your Word this evening. Maybe some, God, that will watch or hear some of the Easter story that they've never heard before. And Lord, we pray that it'll be something that interests them, that will we'll keep them tuned in over the next few weeks, that we really dig in uh, to what your Word says. Father, we pray for uh, any uh, engagement of commentary tonight from the folks here or the folks online. Lord, we pray that it's uh, beneficial to them for learning and understanding and most of all, application. God, we thank you for the activities coming up in the church. We look forward to resuming your Sunday school here in a couple of weeks and all the other activities that are planned. We just pray, Lord, you can center those things and as we uh, begin to really gather back together and see things moving for you. Father, we pray for that. One more uh, quick announcement before we get into the, uh, uh, the the Bible study is don't forget our church teaching dinner is scheduled for Sunday night. So if uh, you're going to be available for Sunday night, come on out. Uh, let Susan know if you're um, if you're planning on coming. If you would do that, that will be a tremendous help for us. Um, they're going to be working on setting the tables up and getting those all spaced out and uh, ready to go. I know the menu is. It's Really a good one. A big steak and mashed potatoes and corn and green beans and dessert. Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're going to feed you well. So uh, come out, uh, be a part of that. This is a catered meal. Uh, and they did this stuff last year and had a wonderful time. And uh, that was before everything shut down. And so this will be the first time we've gathered together as a church for a meal since. So we hope that you'll be able to come out. If you do not feel comfortable coming out, uh, the deacons are aware that some of you may not. It's okay. Just call and let Susan know. And uh, we'll box up a meal for you, and you can swing by, they'll run it out to your car and give it to you. And then you can go home and you can dial in on the Zoom, and you'll be able to um, get the get the conversation and stuff like that for your time. So we want to accommodate anybody and everybody that's, that's interested in that. Okay, so let's get into the Word of God. How about it? We're going to go to Luke chapter 19. So if you have your sword with you, that's where we're going to go tonight. We just want to talk with you a little bit about the Easter story before we get into the, to the uh, to the service. Um, number one is that the Easter story is found in all the Gospels. And why wouldn't it be? It's good news, right? The Gospel means good news. And there's nothing better than Jesus' uh, resurrection. 
And unfortunately, he had to die and be buried. Uh, but thank God he rose again. Thank God that he came out of the grave. And because he lives, we get to live. Uh, but there's not much better news than that, right? If he can overcome the grave, we can. And uh, because of that, the uh, Easter story is in all the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have their own spin on this story. And I always like to go back when I do my personal studies, and, and if you don't do this, I'd encourage you to try and do it. It's a lot of fun. Is to go back and find the story in one of the other books and read it. And pretend, if you will, this is what I do, I know it's crazy, but pretend as you read it that that is like Sandy's account. Okay, Sandy's here tonight. So it'd be like, I'm going to read Matthew's version and I pretend it's Sandy's Matthew and she's telling me what she saw. Well, then when I read that, then I go over and see what Gary has to say. Gary, what happened? back, you know, what's the Easter story? And he starts telling. Well, what we find out is everybody's dropping a few new nuggets here and there. And so, like, tonight, you're going to hear me read from Luke's account, but I'm going to go back and pull a few things, like out of John, for instance, tonight, that Luke doesn't capture, but John felt was important. So it's in his gospel. So in the whole Easter story, you'll find that. And it's, it's for instance, like Mark. You know, Mark kind of always has the, the darker view in the Bible. And you want to see how Jesus, you know, like on the cross and how dark, I mean, it, it's, you, you get his words from the cross. It's a real gloomy picture in Mark's account from that. I mean, it was definitely gloomy, but his writing is much more intense uh, about that. So, so go back and get those few nuggets um, and, and treat it like a, treat it like you're an investigator. Look for the little things that, that jump out. And it all has meaning when you look at the bigger picture. And and uh, you pull it all together, and you get a pretty, pretty amazing thing. So why do we start with the uh, what's called Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem? Well, when we think of the word triumph, we think of the word win. You know, it's a big celebration of a win. But it's weird that it's his triumphant entry into Jerusalem when he's about to be persecuted and killed. Um, but the, this is the beginning of the end. Now, we could say that the beginning of the end started with his baptism. Uh, just like you and I, every day that we live, we die in the flesh. Uh, but, but this really put the, the story of Jesus' uh, death, burial, resurrection into high school. This is the final time he is heading to uh, Jerusalem. William Hedrickson, he called the triumphant entry, he said, an event of outstanding significance. Uh, that's what he wrote back in the 70s when talking about this. And tonight, as the scholar suggests, Luke's record is really about the uh, going into Jerusalem, but not his actual, you know, the, the other Gospels capture more of him going in into the actual city. This is more about the journey. You'll see how it jumps. You know, it, it talks a lot about the praise, the parade, and then it jumps to now he's in the temple, um, or at the temple. So you, you'll see that. And so that's one of the things you're going to notice immediately different if you go back and look at the other, other Gospels. So let's get into this. I'm going to read tonight from NIV translation. You know, that's my favorite. You all have your own. And um, and, and you read the one that, that you feel most comfortable with. And um, and follow along. This is good, good stuff here. Um, so let's talk about what happened right before this, too. Remember, especially in, in the Gospels, a lot of the stories segue. You know, for our study, if we were reading Scripture together, we usually do chapters and verses and things like that. But when the Bible, when these scrolls were written, they were continuous. And so this story uh, in chapter 19, if you look at the beginning of chapter 19, it talks about who? Zacchaeus. Remember climbing the tree? You know, so Jesus is on the move, right? So obviously he's, he's had dinner uh, with Zacchaeus, and he is he's moving on. The, 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 the parable story is being told. You see a lot of red. Uh, if you have a red letter Bible in 19, a lot of Jesus talking here. And then at verse uh, 28, what we're going to start tonight, is what my subheading, what, what's your subheading say? Mine says the triumphal uh, entry. Is that what most of them probably say that for the subheading? And so now he's ready to come to Jerusalem. This will be the last time in his life that he'll make this. Why were people going to Jerusalem at this point? Do you know why? I mean, there was a lot of traffic that was happening. Passover was coming, right? The big celebration, well, communion, right? You think about communion this coming. The Last Supper, it was the Passover meal. This was a pilgrimage. This was a pilgrimage for the believers. 
to, to get there. So there was a lot of traffic going to Jerusalem, a lot of people moving in that direction. And, you know, the, the numbers vary on how many people would make the trek to Jerusalem. But, um, of course, we know there were money changes. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Because there were people that came from outside the area. They had to exchange their currency. Some had to have, um, they had to have sacrifices. So they would need, they couldn't bring their animal that far. They had no need to care for them or provide for them. So they would come and get an animal. Um, so a lot of bustle and traffic. So the fact that Jesus is going to Jerusalem, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody else was there. But the way Jesus goes matters. And what's happening on his journey now. And the first thing you're going to notice as we get into this is there's, there's a lot of people getting riled up because Jesus is coming in excitement. And there's one key event that John tells us why these people were so excited about him coming out. It's the only gospel that gives us that information. So let's get into it. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Lord willing, we'll get through. Gary tells it never happened. But the goal is to get through 20 verses of Scripture tonight. Very familiar story, and, and we'll read part of this, and then we'll stop and, and take your comments. Those of you online, feel free to chime in. Those of you here, we'll give you plenty of opportunity to, to shout out where you are. After Jesus had said this, this was the, the parable, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at a hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. So that's the instruction. Let's just stop there for a minute. We really don't know where death page is. Um, there's, you're not finding it on that. But we have a clue because it's near Bethany. And it's in the, the Mount of Olives region. So we know where that's at. If you were to go to Israel today, one of the places you would visit would be the Mount of Olives. It's a big hill, and that's every picture you see of the gold dome and all that stuff, the dome of the rock, all the pictures you see of Jerusalem, all those are taken from the Mount of Olives. That's, that's where they take the picture from. A lot of graves going up the hill where Jewish people have been buried, and, um, and, and it's significant for a lot of reasons. But in, in this place, that's, that's the vicinity where this has happened. That's the area where they are. So he's going on to Jerusalem, and on the way there, he's got to pass over the mountain of Olives. And why, why do you think they would call it the Mount of Olives? Any, any thought on that? Olive trees. Olive trees, yeah. And, there, and that's, you see a lot of them. I was amazed by them. I was the only guy taking pictures of olive trees like they were beautiful sequoias or something. Uh, I thought that was really kind of cool. Yeah, but, did you actually see olive trees? No, oh. no, I, I didn't see any. I mean, I, I don't think I ever got that close. The Garden of Gethsemane, you know, they had the trees there that they dated back because of how big they are. They believe they were probably standing about the time of Jesus. But uh, I, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't get that. Not that I, I don't remember. I think I was probably going to have my mouth open too big. But I couldn't believe I was there, actually. Look, I found myself doing that a lot. Of I want to go back. So I don't have to do that. Uh, but after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them to go to a village and get this colt. Do you find that interesting? That Jesus would do that? What, what, is, what would you think if I told you, okay, um, Doug, I want you to go to the middle school and there's going to be a, a colt over there. Just untie it and bring it over here. And if anybody sees you do that, just tell them the pastor. Now, if, if that was the instruction I gave you, though, I mean, you're risking jail here, right? I mean, you can't take somebody's donkey. Do you find that weird? Do you find that, does anybody find that strange? I find it strange. You know, that, that we do. Now, the scholars spend a lot of time on this. Because we know Jesus knows everything, right? We know God knows everything. But it's interesting to see what happens because they do just what he says and this is what transpires. But I want you to think as we study this, what would you do if that was you? What would you do if your teacher, your rabbi, told you to go do that? I mean, basically, you were kind of hijacking a cult here, you know, carjacking a cult, uh, for lack of a better term. And then, 
if somebody says something, you just tell them the Lord Jesus. Like, like it's no big deal. Okay. You know? And so in a moment, we're going to talk about there's about four ideas on the way that could have transpired. Um, but, but those are the things that make me go, hmm, you know, that's a conversation for heaven, right? How does that work exactly? But I gotta, I gotta give it to the disciples. They did whatever they were told. Verse 32 says, those who were sent ahead went and found it. What's the it? The donkey, the colt, right? They had found it just as he had told them. Now, you and me as Christians, we'd say, duh, Jesus told me where to go. You went there, and guess what? You found exactly what he said was there. You know, so, but, but I think it's interesting. There was no discussion here. Um, because I think I would have had a discussion with the Lord here. You know, like, well, what if they shoot me? <laughs> you know, what if they meet me with a cane? You know, what if this doesn't work right? What, what if they argue with me? What if they say no? You know, what am I supposed to do? But there's none of that. And in fact, in most cases in the Bible that I've been able to find, if you found something different, let me know, because I'd like to take note of it, is that when Jesus said to go and do, they go and did. Right? I mean, they, they went, and they did what they were told to do. There was obedience there. There wasn't a lot of rationalizing out why or why not. You know, you, you just, and, and I wonder why in my life, when God tells me to do things, Kathy, why am I rationalizing with God? Why? Or are you sure this is going to work? Or are you, are you really, really sure, God, and not just doing what He leads me to do, or what what His Word tells me to do? So I think we can learn a little bit from the disciples here, right off the bat, that if the Lord says do it, we need to do it. And um, and so He's had the plan. The other thing is, God knows how it's going to work with the other. We don't. And I would imagine the disciples would have been worried about this because you know, had it been another Jewish person. Uh, which probably was, that had the donkey, you know, they could have been put to death for theft, right? I mean, you could have got your arm cut off, you know, for stealing. So, I mean, there was a risk involved here if it didn't go well. So those who were, verse 32, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? Now, I don't know about you, but I think the heart would have started beating very fast at this point. Am I the only one that thinks that way when I study the Bible? You know, I'm like, oh, Lord. You know, you know I wonder what they said. <laughs> I wonder what they said. Wait. You know. But, but I also believe God was preparing them for what was going to happen. And, and let, let's look at this conversation, because this is interesting. And I'll tell you, you know, what the theologians believe the significance of this is. Because there, there's some interesting stuff. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Verse 35 says, they brought it to Jesus. So guess what? They let it pass. Now, so the question is, why wouldn't they ask him, what's he going to do with it? Now, if I told you, any of you, I'll pick on time for a minute. If I told time, I, I, I'm, I'm going to take your car. Right now. Because I need it. And she says, okay. And I get in and take off. I kind of believe in my mind that there would be a few questions she would have. For instance, where are you going? More importantly, how long will you have my car? You are going to bring it back. Right? You know, I mean, you are going to feed it, right? You are going to water it, right? I mean, there's got to be, you know, and, and that's, those kind of things, and some of you at home say, this guy is lost. I don't know why I'm even watching this. He's talking about the disciples hijacking a cold here. You know, listen, this is how Bible study becomes interesting. This is how Bible study gets fun. This is how Bible study makes us realize these were real people in that day. And I believe when they saw them untying that coat, there was probably a little bit of panic here. And, but interestingly, the guy gives it. Now, here's what the scholars say. There's, and, and there's not, I was telling Gary this today, he and I were talking a little bit, and I said, what's interesting is there's no wrong way to look at this. But they're all ideas, and they all make sense. So you have to kind of wrestle with it and see what you think. And then I'll be curious to see what you think. Number one, 
is in this culture, people were very hospitable to other people. If you had a need and they could meet it, and they were poor people, it was an honor for them to be able to help you out. So if he had, if someone had need of that cult and it wasn't really being used, you know, for, for their own personal need, then it would be very likely that anybody would have lent it out. With the understanding, the honor system, it would be returned. Now, you and I loan things out today. We hope it makes it back. But there was the honor code. It used to be that way with money, right? It used to be you could give money to somebody or shake hands that they're going to pay off some. My, my parents told me, now, you, you all may have experienced something like this, but where, where my parents grew up, there was a store there, and everybody would shop there. And my dad told me that his parents would go there, and they would buy groceries for the week on credit. Well, they didn't have a credit card. You know, they would write it down, and then you would come back, and you would pay for it. And they would do that. And like around Christmas time. But everybody did that. And everybody, they didn't mail a bill. They didn't mail you a notice. You just came and you paid your bill. And everybody did it. Like, there was no passing collection. If you asked somebody, like a flower shop or something like that, do you have any outstanding bills? And they would be like, you have no idea. Right? But back then, there, there, there was a, a, and even in Jesus' day, particularly here, but, but even back in, in those days, you know, 50s, 40s and 50s, people really, for the most part, kept to their word, and your word meant something. So the one thought was, is that out of hospitality in this culture, it was an honor for them to be asked, and the fact that the Lord needed it, if they knew that was Jesus, his fame uh, that was spreading at this point, which we'll talk about in a moment, may have been even more exciting to lend it. That was, that was one thought. The other thought was, is that Jesus had already approached those people. And knowing that he was going to be going to Jerusalem and told them there may come a time where I'll need your donkey. If so, I will send someone to get it. Which would kind of make sense too, because if he did that, then they would have expected it. The Lord had to be, oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, go ahead. You know, so that, that was a thought. And it was also talking that Jesus, because he's Messiah, knew he would be going into Jerusalem and, and make things well. Now that, you know, my issue with that is he's God, right? He can the you know, Holy Spirit can move people to do whatever God wants them to do. And uh, so, yeah, uh, take or leave that one. And, and, and then the third notion was, is that it was truly just a, uh, an act of divinity. You know, that it was a God thing. You know, that that person at the right time would loan the cult. Maybe the neighbor would have. Maybe the neighbor would have had a problem. Maybe the neighbor would have called 911, right? Maybe that would have happened. But in this specific case, so those were a couple of the three uh, things that the people wondered. Um, and, and like I said, none of those are really right or wrong. I, I kind of tried laying out, wrestled in my own mind, thinking what was probably more like it. I like the hospitality thing uh, better. I'm thinking that, you know, that was part of their culture. It would have been for another Jewish person. You know, that, you know, it was not uncommon for people to put people up, uh, to give them lodging, to take care of those in need, as long as they were of the same uh, ethnicity. Um, so that, that wouldn't have been a problem. But um, what do you guys think? What do you all think about that? There's no right or wrong. Anybody have a thought? I think it's twofold. I don't think the disciples thought anything was going to do it because they had lived in the last of the papers and called the city they put the city to the master. So we'll get some short. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me say for the folks at home, so uh, Sean's telling us here tonight, he thinks the disciples just did what you want them to do because this is Jesus. He'd been performing miracles, he'd calmed the seas, they had been with him, whatever. Why, why even question what he wanted you to do, right? Yeah, this, this is really nothing compared to what they had seen him do with that. Oh, this is an easy one. Yeah. This is an easy and, one. And I also kind of with you on the hospitality thing because when you look at even Christ's birth, Mm -hmm. 
See, that, that was the other part I think that's kind of that's kind of hidden in all this is the fact if, if you don't think about his fame, remember, there's not a whole lot of people. Like you and I think of like big cities as like New York. You know, floods and multitudes of people. And, and you know, multitude, the word multitude in the Bible, when you see that, that means there's too many to count. When there were 5,000, you know, they knew there were 5,000, but when the Bible uses multitude, there was no way to capture how many. And even with the 5,000, they would say, and women, and children, you know, it was, there were more than that, you know, that would have been there. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's fascinating, but his, his fame, you're going to see here in a minute, and maybe, and I'll go ahead and jump there, is because of Lazarus. What he did with Lazarus. And we'll go look at what John said about it. Because he said everybody came out to see him because they were there. They saw what he did. And so they were, they were going to be where he was. Because why? Everywhere he was, he fed people. He healed people. And he brought people back to life. Why would you not want to be around? Now, now theologically, why would we not want to be around the same Jesus? Why would we not want to come to church? Why would we not want to be a Christian? You know, we have, as, as a church, and I mean the church, we have to show people that Jesus is alive today as he was then. We treat him like he's dead, and, you know, we go visit him in the temple. That's not the way it is. You know, God, God's still on the throne. He's still in control. The same Jesus, you know, exists today. He's, he's in heaven. You know, the, but the Holy Spirit, who he gave us, is God in us. You know, who leads us. One big difference is the reason that we keep questioning these times in the past a lot. It's just been stacked. It's not that 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 Jesus' words, a lot of what's in the Bible is scripture. I mean, Old Testament scripture. But remember, that's God. You know, it's not just Old Testament. It's God's word. So why would he not speak his word? You know, like tonight, I'm going to say, here's how he quoted scripture from the Psalms. But wait a minute. He wrote Psalms. Why wouldn't he speak like that? We forget that. If this is God's word, you know, if, if Jesus... Okay, he's got to be right? And, and you know how to you got something? Yeah, this is also a Catholic to the Jewish people. And if that is such a thing to do, and if they say the Lord needs it, now they can say, tell me why you're wrong, you got to say, you know what? That's a great point because one of the things you're not going to hear in the Easter story is somebody say, who is that guy? Yeah. It's not there. You know, they, they, who do they say? You know, are, are you the Christ? You know, he was questioned by Pilate, right? And what did Pilate say? Did I say? Right? But everybody, they had heard about this guy. And especially the Jewish people. And especially the Jewish church. The leadership. The religious people. Because why? He was a threat to them. And, and remember, that's why he was crucified. You understand that? They, they twisted the law to make him a threat to Rome. But re in reality, it was a threat to their control. Because the Jewish people controlled the Jewish people. Yeah. I think the most important point out of everything that you brought up is what does brought up about the scripture has been brought by the prophesied. Mm -hmm. it, it's already been written. So the important to have them. Christ being born the way it had been prophesied, like you said, God spoke that. And it's going to happen just that way. And that's why it happened. There was no coincidence. There was no, uh, maybe it was a steady leading time, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. It was simply God spoke to you in existence. And, and you know, someday he's going to come back, because he said he will, and nothing can change. 
Kevin does both talking about for those of you home, but talking about prophecy being fulfilled. This is all part of prophecy being fulfilled. Which I mean, let me tell you this. This is also another reminder to you and me that we need to pay attention because the Bible is not completely finished yet as far as being totally fulfilled. We're waiting for Christ to come back, right? And you bet. Now we, we you and I still go to bed at night. We expect more grass tomorrow, or we're gonna do. I don't know my grass. You know, we expect to get up and do what we're gonna do. But how many of us are walking out the door, you know, we'll look up at the airplane that flies over, we hear the helicopter, we'll look up and see it, but how many of us walk around and say, today's the day, Jesus, you know, that you're coming up. See, they did that in his day. And, and we don't know how long that continued, but when he said, I'll, the way you see me go up, I'll come again, right? And, and people did that. They literally were waiting for him to come back every moment. And so they were on guard. But, but the other thing is, um, as far as the people here, Paul talks about this, you know, you and I see through the glass dark. You know, we don't have a clear picture. We, we, we have to really, you know, they, they got to be with Jesus. They got to be with him. They, they saw the miracles. They did that. But yet there were still people who didn't believe. Even though they saw it, they still rejected him. You know, and, and still wouldn't accept him. And look at us. We believe, and this is what we have. Right? But we see people's lives change. We see our own lives change. So, Anyway, let's keep let's keep trucking, or we're only going to get through ten verses and Gary's going to say, "I told you so." All right. So, um, verse thirty-four. They replied, "The Lord needs." It. Verse thirty-five. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. What is a cloak? The outer garment. It's an outer garment, right? And that's in all the pictures of Jesus that you see. Where he's not being crucified, you'll see him obviously with that. But what were cloaks also used for? Any, any other thoughts? What else could a cloak be used for? Blanket? Yeah. Covering. Warm, just like you would with your jacket. You wear your jacket when it's cool. But if you go into a theater and you're a little cool, you might turn it backwards and wear it like a, a, a warming thing. So they, they, they lay these cloaks down. Why would they lay their coats? And I'm just going to call it a coat. Why would they lay their cloaks down in front of this donkey? Why would people do that? Respect. Like they would be in. Yeah. Respect. And, and let, me give you, let me give you the old cartoon analogy. When the mud hole is there and the little white lady is going to cross it, the guy threw her down his jacket so she could walk over the, the same. It, it, was, it was a sign of honor. It was, it was making a path. You notice what we're not seeing? There's something missing in this story right now. Right now we're talking about clothes. What else? Is there anything jumps out at you that's missing right now? Palm the palm branches. There's no record of palm branches here. But we get that in John's Gospel. In the other one, we'll talk, one of the other Gospels, we'll talk about it just being like limbs. But John specifically, I believe it is, will say palm. So see, that, that's what Palm Sunday is came about. That, that's why. And why were they waving palms? It was another symbol of, of respect and honor. And when there was victory, people would wave palm branches in the sign of victory. So you, you think these are neat things. And you wonder, well, why do we call it Palm Sunday? Well, why do we, why are the kids marching around waving palms? Why do they do that? Well, they did it here. Why? Because it was, it was a sign of honor and victory. We're winning. Jesus is coming, you know? And it was, it was like the foam fingers of the day. You know, the palm branch was the foam finger. That finger, you know, that you wave around. So what else? Oh, lawful place here. You find where I'm at. Help me out. Where am I at? Totally lawful place. Verse 36. Got it. I'm going back to 30. They brought it to Jesus, threw the cloaks of the cold, and put Jesus on it. And when he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, this is what I'm telling you, it's a big hill. You can oversee the whole city. There's no doubt if he's on the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem is in his sight. It's still in the sight today. If you go there, you're going to see it all. It, it is in every book. Every, when you see it, you're going to be like, that's what the picture is. And now when I see the TV show or TVN or something, they show sure that, that scan, I'm like, I never took that picture. I'm just standing right there. It, it's the same picture everywhere. And I would imagine he saw this. 
He says, when he goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Now here, we see for all the miracles they see. But if we go to John's Gospel, and uh, but let's, let's look over there for a minute. I think it's John chapter 12. Let's, if you can do that real quick with me. Kevin, I don't have this for you to put up at home. So you guys at home will just have to hang in there with me. But let's look over here to John. John 12, 12. And 12, 13, I believe it is. Let me just read a little portion of it. The next day, the great crowd had come from for the feast. They had that was talking about Passover. Had heard that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches. See, there they are. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written in the scripture. This is what Doug was talking about. Do not be afraid, O God of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him that they come to pass. See, they didn't even know at that time. They were living it in real life. You and I have, you know, we've got a DVR. We can go back and read it and figure out what was really going on. They didn't have it. They were living it in real time. Why don't you on a donkey? Shouldn't it be on a stallion? You know, shouldn't it be in a chariot? You know, why don't you want to be, you know, why wouldn't you want to be like all the other parades? Oh, I want the donkey for whatever reason. And now here it is, verse 17, this is what I want to get to. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. See, there were Lazarus coming back after he'd been dead for three days. And I believe the King James said he was stinking. Right? You know, three days in the tomb. And then boom, he comes back, right? So... Anyway, I want you to see his popularity is growing. Now let's go back over into Luke 19. When he came near the place where the road went down and out of all, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And uh, again, if we were to go over to Psalms, we would find we would find that blessed is the king. Uh, some of the Pharisees in uh, the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke you. Let me, let me look at it. I want to make sure I, make sure I got that right. I don't want to say that. <laughs> Psalm 118.26. Psalm 118.26 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that was a, what, what are the Psalms? Psalms. So they were, they were celebrating. So when we see this scripture, we, 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 the kids walk around, you know, they're singing, waving the palm branches, you know, for Palm Sunday. But here, we, we understand why they were using this specific word. It was a celebration. It was a song. They were waving, having a good time. You know, he's, he's coming to save us. He's going to Jerusalem to overthrow. You know, we're going to, he's going to have his kingdom here. We're going to have plagues. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't realize what's about to happen. You know, they're celebrating. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Well, you notice it wasn't all the Pharisees. You may have thought, why it's not all the Pharisees? The Pharisees were part of the ruling group at the time. Uh, you, you, you always, they were the hypocrites, if you will. Um, you know, I told you the other day when people say, well, they're all hypocrites of the church. And you said, that's where they should be. They're in church. Right? Um, but, but they were the people who didn't practice what they preached. And some of the Pharisees, I think the others were in shock at what they were witnessing. Well, there might have been a few that believed, too. Exactly. Yeah. Do you know any? Off the top of your head? In the Bible? Um, There's a couple mentioned. Matthew. Well, Nicodemus. Joseph. Joseph Arimathea, yeah. So there, there's a few of them, you're right. I mean, they were secretly, you know, they're, and remember, they knew the scripture. They know the word. And I believe some of them could make the connection. And, and Jesus was telling them, it's written, it's written, it's written. And they, they couldn't get beyond the fact that not only was he a teacher, but he taught like one having authority. Like that knew what it really meant. Not just explaining it, but like, taught like it's the law. 
you know. And that, that says a lot to that whole group. Any, any other thoughts? I'm going to go too fast. Any thoughts where we are? Good. I think they thought of Jesus was going to be the king of the Jews. Mm-hmm. He was going to set up his reign right there. That's what everybody was expecting. And, uh, uh, and he learned as a king of the Jews. They thought, you know, that he was going to be the king of the Jews. And uh, he was going to be the king of the Jews. And he was going to be the king of the Jews. So they were talking about that. God saying that uh, you know there was a, a power struggle and they, they worried that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. You're right, the charge above Jesus' head. See, when they had the crucifixions, they all had their charge above their head what they did wrong. That's the little writing you see on top of the cross. And they did that because, and, and believe it or not, you can go back and look at the history, there were crucifixions that aligned the road. The Romans established a bunch of crucifixions that were on the road. So when you came into town, that you could look up and you could see what their charges were. But the crucifixion was designed to keep people behaving. And they put the charge up there. So like you know, you know, you walk you walk by and you saw people on a cross, you're like, what did Jesus do? Right? But you could look and see what the charge was. And what was Jesus' stuff? It was king to Jesus, right? I mean they, they, it was big betrayed. And of course, like you said, it was all about mockery. I mean, Jesus never talked about his, he talked about you know, his kingdom, but not those people that wanted him to have his kingdom right then. They wanted power. They wanted out of poverty. They wanted, you know, not to be under taxation. Like they, were. They, they were looking for that deliverance. They didn't realize what was about. And that's why Christianity almost died out there initially. Even Jesus' his own disciples were like, wait a minute, we've been following you for three years and this is it? It's over? And, I mean, God has such a brilliant plan in, in all of this to be able to see the way everything worked out. I mean, you and I couldn't have wrote a story like that. Uh, a lot of opportunity if Jesus wasn't who he was for the whole story to end with his death. But uh, we see that was just a good thing. I don't think it's good stuff. Man. I'm enjoying it. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And why did they want the disciples to be rebuked? What did they do? I mean, all the people there chanting and shouting around, you know, they were, they were acting uncivilized. They were cheering. They were singing. They were treating him like a king. They were treating him like royalty. And, um, yeah, stop. And Jesus says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What do you think that means? It's going to be quiet no matter what. It yeah. has to be rocks or animals. Mm-hmm. It's going to be somebody. Yep, and I, I want to—I have a note uh, here somewhere, and I write my notes totally crazy, so I look for it. But uh, that scripture comes from Habakkuk, uh, where they were talking about the wrong that was crying out from Jerusalem, and it said that the stones will cry out. And you think about it—you know, even even the, the the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall in Jerusalem—you know, if, if, if they're silent. It's still going to cry out for him, you know. And uh, but but that but what he said, and you'll see in a moment when he did the money changes that those are scriptures. Those are scriptures that he was sharing. And we just read it like, oh, that was, that sounded good there. But but those were scriptures recorded elsewhere in the Bible that Jesus is, is using. Verse forty one. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over. The commentators say that he bitterly wept, like burst into tears. So it wasn't just like a sniffle or one tear. I mean, remember, I told you, Mount Ball, if you remember the picture that you see in Jerusalem, he sees it and he openly weeps. Why? He says, if you, if, if you, even you, just imagine the passion, just in saying that, what was repeated, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, if you would understand what would really bring peace, he knows right now. But he knows they don't. Okay? He says, but now it's hidden from your eyes. And what is that? What's hidden from their eyes? Okay. 
See, Jesus, remember, he's about to go through the Last Supper. He's about to go to the garden. He's about to wrestle with that cup that's placed before him. This is just another step in that direction. Things are coming together. He says, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hang you on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave, not leave one stone on another because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And of course, we know that Jerusalem will be destroyed in the year 66 to 70 AD. So about 60, you know, 30 to 60 years after Jesus' death, that prophecy is coming true. That Jerusalem will be destroyed. So he, he even sees that. So even though they think they're in a state of peace, that, oh, this, you're going to establish a new kingdom right now, but you think, you know, that this salvation is coming that you don't see right now. But here, there's still destruction coming. This is, this is minor what you're in. Absolutely. And I think, I think that applies to the day. Yeah. You know, I, I, in, in, as a minister, it's probably the hardest thing for me because I, I remember very well, and I don't want to preach a sermon for Sunday, but, um, you know, Sunday, we're going to talk about the story of, of the gathering, um, or Garrison, or whatever it's called, um, where Legion, the guy that was possessed with the demons, you know, labeled an outcast, placed away, and all that. But then at Jesus' presence, just his presence, changed something. And, and even with, I mean, and we're going to talk about that, but there's so many people today that are living in, in bondage. Their own bondage, their own torment, their own problems, their own, you know, depression, anxiety, and, you know, the things that just keep them down, that they don't realize, you know, Jesus can touch them. And, you know, we've got him in our midst, we need, we need to tap into the power that he has. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, even in this time, I mean, he was with them. They saw the miracles that some people just refused, like they do today, to accept it. So then, look at verse 45. It jumps from the story of Jesus on his way there. Now it jumps to Ben. He's at the end. So the other, you're going to see a little more information in the other Gospels that fill in that time to here. So then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. That's scripture. And um, that scripture um, is, is also one that Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was talking about the wrongs that were going on at the temple, he, he used this very scripture. And he was prophesied on behalf of the Lord. He said, The Lord said it. Right? And he said, and, and Jesus uses it again here, meaning that he was, that as God, he was unhappy with what was happening. Now here's the thing. Now this scripture gets really messed up in a lot of different places. Some people will use this scripture and they'll say, well, you know, you, you, you can't buy or sell in the church. And they'll say, you can't do that. Because, and they'll quote this scripture. That's not what was happening. The outer court in, in the temple, it was okay for them to sell sacrificial animals. You needed them. If you didn't have one, I'm not a farmer. I have no animals. If I had to go sacrifice, I'd have to go buy them. Many of you would too. we have to go buy them. The problem is, is when they're profiteering, or they're inspecting your animal and says it's not good enough, now you've got to go buy them. They were corrupt. They were tainting the process. They were exchanging money. Because the Jewish people, the, the temple money didn't have an image on it. Roman money had, uh, had images on it. So they wouldn't take that because it was blasphemy. So they would have to change money. And change currency. So they could put their money in the box. And they would get cheated. If I went to Mexico today and gave them $10 and said give me pesos, I'd have no idea how many they're going to give me. I trust they give me the right amount. But there's probably some shady people over there in any country that would say, oh yeah, you get five. And maybe I'm supposed to get 20. I don't know. But Jesus called them out on it here. And he's talking about corruption. But then, look what he does. So we know he throws them out, and in the other gospels they go into detail. You know, whipping them, and, you know, doing the whole nine yards. But verse 47, he says, it is written, he said it in my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, 
But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Why didn't they kill him for upsetting the money changers? Why didn't they do that? Well, <laughs> probably. They probably did. Well, I read, one of the scholars I was reading said that um, that the outer court were just disturbed, where the, the, the money exchange and stuff was happening, was open to everybody. And because it was the outer court, it was kind of a reprimand. It was it frowned upon. But there were other disturbances that occurred in the outer court. The inner court were the teaching that takes place in the inner court. And so, obviously, they... they their attention was raised. And this next part, where now he's teaching, is going to make it worse. So everything that we build up over the next two weeks, even when we show the Passion of Christ on Wednesday, remember the blood pressure of the Pharisees and Sadducees is raising. The blood pressure is raising. And they've had enough. And it says, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. So see, that's why we're stopping there tonight. This is where the point is. This is what, you know, they were they were after before. They tried to throw him off the press, but they tried to do all that stuff before. But now, now, he's, he's making the seat of the temple. Now you're in my space. Now you're on my turf. And not only did you cause the problem out front, which as Susan said, you're, you're hurting my back end on this, the bottom line. But, not only are you doing that, but now he's teaching. And they're flocking to hear him teach. And it's getting a little closer, a little closer. You're moving in the temple. Right? And uh, so so they're, they're out to get rid of it. And so next week, we're going more well. We'll continue with that. And then we're going to find out how Judas portrays him. There's not a lot of discussion on Judas. Um, but, we, but I want you to see, you know, the attitude before Judas does that. Because they're not, they're trying to figure out a way to get to him. And they don't know completely how he's working. You know, what his inner work is, how it works behind the scenes, who's who. And Judas is about to, to be there in between. And uh, so we're going to see that. We'll see that we'll talk about the Last Supper. We'll, we'll, we'll have those two areas next week. And then the following week, we'll be watching the passion in here, in the sanctuary. And, uh, and, and that should put us all into a pretty good state of mind for Monday, Thursday, which will be Thursday. So Wednesday, Thursday, emotionally, you kind of be down a little bit, the Holy Week, but that's the way you should be, to really enjoy Easter the way it should be. Remember, it was, it was good for mankind in the world on Friday, but it was a great day for mankind on Sunday. So, any, any final thoughts? You know, and, and the parade will come, the half parades were a common thing, but they were military victories um, that were often, and here Jesus comes riding on a colt, a symbol of peace, humbleness, and, um, and, and really he wasn't there to stir up problems. He was there, he was there to get to the cross, and he just started that process. Any other final Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Father God, thank you tonight for the lesson. Thank you for the great discussion. Lord, it's so much fun, Lord, to, to hear from your people. And Lord, that and we can wrestle with these things. And Lord, it just opens our eyes to these things. and makes us want to go back and look up these things and study more about them. You know, even, even Lord, the, the role of the money changers and how that works in that whole process. Lord, to understand the background, the culture of these things, the hospitality, the culture of hospitality, all these things, Lord, that we know that really played in, into the story and, in, and into our uh, Bibles that we have. Now, thank you uh, for giving us interest to be here. Thank you for giving us interest to watch and listen. Father, I pray now that we can share what we've learned with somebody else. Encourage them, Lord, to watch again next week as we begin to prepare our hearts uh, for a Resurrection Sunday. God, the Easter season is upon us. Let us look at it this year with uh, great anticipation and expectation that we're going to be blessed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Till we meet again, I'll see you Sunday morning at 1045. Take care.